fish. Full weight fish. Before I get started, so when it's time to flight 245, we can wait. Unless you want to ask a question of me while we wait. Anything you want to know? Okay, I'll tell you stuff about me. That's what we're doing. Uh, <laughs> my name's Calvin Reed. I'm a senior news editor at Publishers Weekly. Uh, and I'm also co-editor of PW Comics World, perfect time for commercial. Um, in case you don't know what PW Comics World is, it's a monthly email newsletter published by uh, Publishers Weekly about comics and graphic novel marketplace. Um, but it also uh, uh, points to our online coverage in general. So we publish stuff on a daily basis about the comics and graphic novel marketplace, particularly as regards to the general book market. Uh, PW was instrumental in really bringing the comics industry into the book market. Uh, but we publish stuff, news, interviews, cool stuff of all kinds uh, on a daily basis. Uh, but I'm going to start and introduce the panel, and uh, we'll just go ahead and get started. As I said, my name's Calvin Reed. Uh, from Publishers Weekly, I write about comics, but it is my pleasure uh, to, uh, to moderate this panel, the graphic novel. We've got six really interesting examples of some of the great work that's being done today. Um, let me go down the, the line here and introduce um, my esteemed panelists. Um, on my right, M.K. Reed, one of the co-authors of the Cute Girl Network. Um, I don't have the book in front of me. She's got uh, great means. Um, Joe Flood, of the fabulous creative group, uh, published by First Second. Next to her, Lucy Nisley. Uh, her new book is Relish, uh, and she will tell you more about that in a little bit. Next to her, Matt Kent, um, author of Red Handed, uh, also published by First Second, right? Yeah. Um, a, a really interesting uh, ride take on the genre. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Um, uh, Tim Leung, uh, the author of Super Graphic, uh, a visual guide to the comic book universe uh, for Chronicle Books, storytelling by other means. Uh, and next to him, <laughs> Tony Cliff, who, as I told him earlier, uh, I first heard of this book at a backyard in, in behind a bar in Alameda County in San Francisco, drinking uh, tropical drinks uh, and listening to a surfer band. And a librarian told me about uh, Delilah Dirk and the Turkish Lieutenant. So there you go. So and then boom, uh, you know, a month later, I'm moderating a panel with him. We live in a magical comic book world. <laughs> I love it. Uh, and the, the the artist who isn't here. Uh, Emma Vicelli, who is the, uh, I think she's the artist, I don't think she, and the adapter as well, um, the, artist. the artist for the Vampire Academy series, uh, based on, here she is, here she is, Sorry. stylish late interest, <laughs> interest. not a problem. Sorry guys. Is there a chair? Like stop. Oh, okay. This is a big place. <laughs> <laughs> did, did you dash? I think I you did. did. <laughs> All right, get settled. Um, you're, you're just in time. You're the last, the last one for me to introduce, and here you are. Um, uh, the graphic novel. Uh, we, we live in a special times, people. Um, <laughs> it wasn't always like this. Uh, it's, it's just a new world of genre diversity. Hey, we love our superhero comics. Superhero comics made me the comics. I am today, but we live in a, in a new world um, that's just full of graphic uh, cleverness of all kind, great imagination and risk taking, stunning graphics, rich storytelling, and all kinds of storytelling for the rest of us. So, um, I'm just going to throw out a couple of questions to let each, well, first I want each, each artist to talk a little bit about themselves and their book, and then I'll throw some questions out, and then we'll get you all involved. So, let's start with, we'll let you. Catch your breath. And we'll jump to the other end. And Tony, Cliff, <laughs> there you go. Come no tell question. us a little bit about yourself, the Latin director the Turkish Lieutenant, and web comics. All right. Is that, yeah, that is. Uh, my name is Tony Cliff, uh, as we have established. Uh, I'm an animator by trade, um, Delilah Dirk, and the Turkish Lieutenant is my first book. Um, he's sort of ooh, a early 19th century sort of adventure romp through uh, the Turkish countryside. Um, it's been compared to Indiana Jones. Oh, thank you very much. <laughs> Indiana Jones and Tintin, um, very <laughs> flatteringly, uh, and has been nominated for an Eisner Award, a Schuster Award, and a Harvey Award, uh, and is now a New York Times bestseller. That's I'm awesome. Nice. Uh, awesome. Nice. awesome. Nice. 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 Uh, 
Maybe a little better? Um, well, yes. Uh, I don't know how much, how, much you want me to, how much detail you want me to go into. Oh, okay. Um, Delilah Dirk is a, uh, is a sword swing adventurous, brash English woman. Uh, she's captured by an officer in the Turkish Janissary Corps. Uh, he interrogates her. His report is so outlandish that he's set to be executed. Uh, she saves him from that fate, and the rest of the story is about how they continue on in their adventurous, adventurous ways, and he tries to repay the debt that he now owes her. Good synopsis. Let's, let's move down the line. Tim. Uh, my name is Tim Leon. <clears throat> I am the only person here that isn't actually a graphic novelist, so sorry. Uh, but, uh, I have a book that just came out this year called Super Graphic, uh, a visual guide to the comic book universe, and it's a book of infographics about comic books. Uh, it has not won any cool awards or anything, uh, but my mom has told me she really likes it. So, you know, trending upwards. Uh, it just came out a couple of months ago from Chronicle Books, and like I said, it's a book of infographics that are about comic books, um, charting histories and um, power breakdowns and story arcs, um, compare, you know, um, charting how many people have died in the first 100 issues of The Walking Dead, but then breaking it up by if they were killed by zombies or by humans. Uh, so fun stuff like that. Yeah. And it's unfortunate we don't have visuals for this, obviously, yeah, but we should, because this is, when I make the joke about storytelling by other means, I, that's what I mean. I mean, he's using numbers and research and turning them into the topic that he's talking about. It is beyond clever and really <laughs> beautiful to look at. And it's, it's, you know, it's the kind of book you can really blow a whole afternoon on, just jumping from page to page. <laughs> so Matt. Um, I did a book called Red Handed, which is my latest book. Um, I've been doing graphic novels for like 12 years. And I average about a book a year, give or take. Um, this book was my, I thought it was my first Crime book, and I actually, my very first book was a crime book too, but this, when I approached this, I wasn't even really thinking about it as a crime book, but more of like what I could do that hadn't been done with crime books. So I tried to do a crime book that didn't have any murders or people dying or anything being stolen in it. So um, the original title of the book was called Strange Crimes, and that's kind of what it is. So and they, they are indeed. So there's a, like a guy who's, crimes. Yeah, like a, one woman who's, who's trying to write the biggest rap biggest novel ever, so she's stealing signage from all over the city and assembling it in a warehouse, you know, and then taking photos of it. Um, and then she gets notes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> she gets notes from an editor and she gets really yeah. upset because it's really hard to write a book like that. Um, <laughs> yes, you can imagine the editing, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, there's that, and then there's a guy who just steals one painting and then cuts it into pieces and then sells the pieces, um, you know, and then the, a lot, of, I mean, there's more to it. There's a lot of pretentious things I could say about, like, the nature of art and what all of it means. Um, you can let, me, crime book. You can let me say the pretentious <laughs> things. There's a, there's a car chase in it, and then somebody does shoot a gun at some point. You know, so. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, I'm Lucy. I forgot my book. I'm sorry. Um, I didn't bring my homework. I, uh, I wrote a book called Relish recently. Um, oh, oh, there it is. <laughs> Um, and I, uh, yeah, my thanks, yeah, it's been a way. <laughs> um, it's about food, because that's what I care about. I really like to eat my food. Um, it's about food. It's an uh, autobiographical graphic memoir. Um, so it's, uh, it's stories about growing up. My mother was a professional chef in New York City in the 70s and 80s and 90s. So it's about my experiences um, in, like, professional kitchens and um, being, like, a little kid or being like an adolescent working there and busting tables and stuff. So um, it's uh, it's also from for a second. It's my second graphic novel. Um, and I think that's all there is to say about it. May I, may I interject? Because it is not. I There are recipes in the book. I have true. made many of them. <laughs> they are elegant and delicious. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to put that on my book. <laughs> Herbs in the making. Here we go. Okay. <laughs> um, I'm Katie. This is my second book, The Cute Girl Network, that is not officially out for another month, but if you go by the first second through that 530 channel, they're giving away some copies, so three books. It is about a girl who meets a guy and is then told by her friends that he is the biggest idiot ever. 
Gotham. Gotham, is it dark? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I've heard that before. <laughs> It's smart. Yeah, there's a lot of girls in it, which is always good. And, uh, I think it's just We'll get back to you. <laughs> All right. Uh, hey, everyone. So I'm Emma, and I'm not always late. <laughs> I literally had another panel. I've had to run over, so I'm really, really sorry. Um, so I do quite a lot of books, but uh, the ones I'm here to talk about are Vampire Academy, mostly. Which, uh, so Frostbite is... Frostbite, and the third book, Shadow Case, is out on December 31st, which we're very excited about to tie in with the movie that's coming out in February, which is super exciting. Um, and they were here yesterday, uh, which we didn't know was going to happen, which was great. Um, these are originally a series written by Rochelle Mead, it's a novel series, um, and I got brought as the artist, and it just so happened that when I read the books, I utterly fell in love with them, so I was really, really hyped to, to get on board with the project, and it's very, very awesome. Um, and what can I say about it? It's called Vampire Academy, which sounds a bit like oh, vampire, like, like Wizard School of Harry Potter, a bit titled differently. But um, but it's actually it's it's, it's an incredible series. Uh, it's got a lot of amazing characters, um, and Rose is its protagonist. Um, who is, uh, I don't want to like dive into too much, but it's just an incredible series. That's all I just say. Just read it. It's amazing. Um, and it also <laughs> it also managed to sneak onto the New York Times bestsellers list with the first book, so I get to we get to top and tail of the New York Times bestsellers. Um, uh, yeah, I'm incredibly proud to be working on this series and uh, looking forward to the third book coming out. Uh, it's adapted by Lee Dragoon, does the script adaptation from Rochelle's books, then I take on the art, um, and then a company called Caravan Studios jump in and do the colours, so it's a bit of a, a teamwork. Um, and yeah, it's very pretty, and it has uh, pretty people in it. <laughs> All right, well, I've got a couple questions, but I'm, I'm going to get everybody in the audience in, involved quickly, so, you know, let me blather for just a bit and then you'll get your chance. Um, so I'm not gonna go any order, I'm gonna throw some questions out because uh, I'm a curious guy. So um, <laughs> I'm gonna jump back to Matt because this is a, this is a, it, it, I mean one of the things I think this panel is kind of showing is that, you know, there's just so many different kinds of things in the market today. I mean, if you're a comics fan, it's an embarrassment of graphic riches. And, and your book is this interesting wry genre take, take on, a, on a genre classic on the detective story, but, you know, all of these crimes, you know, almost can be read as acts of art as well, and, and, and at the center of this book there's this seemingly infallible detective, um, detective or art critic, what, what, uh, uh, crimes or conceptual art, what, what, or, or both. Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny because while, while I'm approaching a book, I don't really think about what it's about until it's done, you know, and then, and then usually I find out in panels like this what it's about. So, <laughs> well, like, well, maybe I helped you along there. But I've done a couple panels, and I already do know what it's about. I've figured out what it is. But yeah, I, like, I, honestly, when I approach it, I do I approach it like a crime book, and I'm like, well, what kind of crimes would I like to commit, you know? And, and so it was more than that, where I was like, oh, if you could just steal one painting, you know, and then you wouldn't be in this much trouble, and you could cut it up. But then I started thinking about, like, it is the nature of the ownership of, you know, how do you own something, you know, how do you own art or whatever, how do you own land, and then, uh, and then yeah, like, in every crime book has to have a detective, so I guess he's, to me, he served this role as, as I don't know if it's, if it's art critic or if he's just trying to spoil everything, like, in a he, 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 he's, um, he talks about how modern he is, his modern techniques and his ability to use technology to, to solve these crimes. Yeah, that was the thing. I, was, I felt like I, he's like the, basically the Dick Tracy character, you know? Yeah, yeah. He's so smart and he can solve any crime. Like, he's, well, there's one crime that's been unsolved forever and he makes a phone call and solves it, you know? And he, it's like nothing he can't solve. And I like the idea of a character who's just so, like, focused on his work and his job and, like, getting, finding the answer um, that he's oblivious to everything else, you know? And, and like, to me, it's, it's as much about that guy, like, as little as you see him, it's his journey of becoming this this cold problem solving monster, not a monster, but a machine into somebody who actually cares about people. Yeah. But there's always this intersection, you know, you know Bar, as you say, the, the, uh, the novelist who writes novels from science and, and basically has warehouses to house the thing. I mean, the, the concepts are like <laughs> insane and kind of mind expanding. <laughs> yeah, that's what, honestly, that idea came from my daughter who, like, she's learning to read. 
It's not like I had some grandmaster plan and this comes from all different places. But my daughter was learning to read, so she's in the back seat while I'm driving. She'll just read random words as we go, like off signs. And, yeah. and then I was like, oh, that'd be funny to like write a whole story using just signage off of whatever. So. But it is a key element in the book where the, no the notion of actually editing the book just completely so yeah, it's it's all, all, yeah, yeah, like especially with graphic novel, like the format of a graphic novel is it's so much work. Like it's not just writing in words and like I can delete and copy and paste. It's like I haven't drawn it. Like any change is like is like a big deal because like I have to redraw it. I hate redrawing. So this was so you didn't need your daughter to suggest yeah, that, no, no, that, that, that part was me. That, that was the was nature me. of the beast. Great. Um, let's see who's next. MK. Uh, the cute girl network. I, well, the thing that I loved about it. Uh, was that your kid, you seem to be offering up uh, this look at how, at the, the, radi the social radius around people and how they interpret what happens to them uh, based on a lot of different things. And, and it seems that the, the main character in the book who's being counseled by her network of cute friends, um, you know, they've all got really good information. None of them are, inaccurate about this dude, but they're not quite right. And the book seems to bring in the issues of, of gender issues, obviously, but you know, um, social issues, maturity issues. Uh, maybe, maybe you could talk about that because I, you know, it's a it's a fun story with you know uh, you know a skater girl, but there you know, I think there's some real nuance in there about how you see how people look at each other in the social matrix. I see, I said, I'll say the pretentious things here, okay? <laughs> You're not sure what I'm talking about. <laughs> no, I'm just not sure how to like, focus that into an answer that's like, um, um, How does, uh, and uh, her name's escaping, how does the central character respond to the pretty um, tough criticisms of her, her love interest? And the guy that she kind of likes. Despite all his faults, I mean, well, you know, the, don't give the whole thing away, but you know, the, the, believe me, it's obvious that they're not, you know, saying nice things about him. Right. Um. I'm you again. Yeah. <laughs> um. Well, they can't be that good if you don't have an answer for them. I mean, I can, but yeah, I'll spoil the whole book. That would spoil the whole book, really. Um, well, no, I don't think it would, but okay. Um. um tell us about the boyfriend. Um. jobs um, and not somebody that would be like you should settle down with this man because he can provide you with a nice future. Can we get a suit? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And he's very particular about his suit. Yes, <laughs> yes you can consult with Lucy about um, <laughs> But she's also uh, she works at a skateboard shop with a bunch of bros. She does indeed. And um, How you work together on it because it seems like a real woman's like perspective on the events of this book. But I'm curious where the the, the, the main idea of the plot came from. Is this from your own life? Is I what made you see fun of him in email, and then he thought it was a good book idea. He was like, I, he was like, oh, I should start going down to the bus station and meeting women before they find out and all like crappy <laughs> okay. romance stories. Like okay. that. I'm like, it'll never work. Ah, yeah. Um, and then he's like, "Say that, say that. We're we're gonna do a yeah. this. I'm like, "Okay, sure, whatever." And then like, when we finish the previous book, um, he was like, "Okay, it's time to work on it." Like, oh, you um, for sure. We and um, Google Docs had like just been invented, so we could um, write everything together, and it's 
think it ended up being fun. Um, it ended up being pretty equal. Um, there's some sections that are just stuff that I did. Just you know how people perceive each other, and how maybe the groups of people around them perceive the two. So whatever. Yeah, I, <laughs> if, you know, I'm apparently issuing spoilers every other word. So we're gonna move on. Um, we're gonna jump down in here. Tony again. I uh, um, I know MK has done web comics. You've done web comics. Um, Lucy does web comics. Uh, I guess do you all do web comics? <laughs> I mean, I guess. I mean, to me, that seems to be uh, really kind of a, a one of the real, I mean, the new mini comics. It's kind of the new platform, it seems, for young cartoonists to kind of get their work out. Can you talk a little bit about how your book got started? I uh, Yes, I can. Um, baby Steps. Uh, it, it, it has, people have described it as a web comic. My intention was always for it to be a graphic novel. Yeah. I always wanted it to be in paper, you know, one volume, sit down, read it. Um, it started off as, as a self-published 32-page uh, comic, which got expanded, which got expanded, expanded, long story short. Uh, it has become the book it is today. Uh, at one point, um, I will admit, I was having trouble getting traction with agents and publishers for the book. Uh, meanwhile, I also wanted to do a second volume, but I did not know whether this was a complete vanity project or whether it would gain traction with readers. So, the reason I put it on the web was to get that feedback and find out, does this have a place in, in you know, people's interests? Um, fortunately, the answer seems to have been, yeah, at least a little bit. Did you use it to find an agent, or did the web, did it, I, or did you just go straight to the publisher? Well, once you put something on the internet, it turns into space magic, and then, you, you end up meeting people who is like, I've read your, read yeah, your work. I've seen Drink your it work. in a backyard one day and like, yeah. Uh, we, we, have a library in, next. we have a librarian friend, Eva, yes. in common, who was an early supporter uh, as, the, uh, as the book was coming out online. So, uh, someone read it and then another person reads it and so on and so forth. So it wasn't designed as a web comic. It was designed to be a real book. I just used the internet to do what the internet does best. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, absolutely. Um, well, it's a terrific, I mean, what a great swashbuckling story. I, I am curious, though, how you chose, you know, the characters. I mean, you have a female heroine. I mean, well, you, obviously, you had a real reason for doing that, so let's hear it. Um, there, there are a lot of ingredients that go into that. Um, Good. It, it's we got time. Let's it's hear. in the early 1800s. There's a lot of, I was reading, um, is anybody familiar with the Horatio Hornblower stories, the Sharp series of Napoleonic War uh, novels? Very exciting. You guys are all reading the wrong stuff. <laughs> um, uh, but there, and so there are ingredients of that. Uh, there's some art history influence that came in there. Um, and there's also a lot of... I was reading mainstream comics and getting kind of bored with a lot of the female characters in there. I grew up knowing actual human females. <laughs> this was not... This was like what I was reading in, in books was not... Not jiving. Yeah, it didn't. They didn't meet up. So, I mean, there are a lot of a lot of a lot of ingredients, and I'm not sure how they eventually distilled into what you see on the page now. But uh, well, she's on a, on a kind of classic. She's dashing. dashing uh, yeah. She's got her own brand of technology <laughs> at hand as well. Um, and she likes tea. Yes. Yeah. So, so you know, there's a couple of teasers for you. <laughs> um, Lucy, your book makes me hungry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, wow. History, uh, food, cookies, junk food, Mexican porn. Where do we start? Um, it, it's well, Mexican porn. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, this, this book, there are, as you said, there are recipes, but there's so much else in this book. I mean, it's your own history, it's your family's history. It's, yeah, just tell us more. Well, we want to know. Okay, when I was 
starting to make this book, I was like, well, I want to like think about food and my connection to food. So I decided to go on one of those lenses. <laughs> Anybody know those things with the like the lemon water with the pepper in it? It's terrible. It's terrible. It's the worst. Um, I mean, it's really good for you, whatever. Um, <laughs> and I went on one of these lenses because I was like, I'm going to try and realign my connection to food, and this would be great. Um, it was the worst experience. It was horrible, and I was miserable the entire time. Not only because I was like hungry, but because I um, realized that it, the act of eating is not just about like nourishing yourself and feeding yourself and like providing you know the correct amount of calories to get you energy through the day. It's it's a lot of like social stuff. A lot of eating is spent um, around other people, and it's a lot about um, sort of breaking up your day, stopping what you're doing to like take time to nourish your body and to like enjoy yourself and have this sensory experience. So um, what I really got out of that experience was that like food equals happy <laughs> and no food equals sad. And um, I, I wanted to write this book about my, uh, my childhood and growing up and how strong a uh, sort of memory connection I have to food, but uh, what really came out of it was the strong emotional connection to food. And I think that comes through. Um, I mean, the, the title of the book is Relish. It's obvious that I really, really love food, and I, I love talking about it and drawing it and writing it, so um, so it's it's very pleasing to me that it makes people hungry, because I, I love my medieval genius, and I'm, just, I'm like working for the food industry. Yeah. <laughs> well, you've all, I mean, also got an, I mean, one of my, one of the things happening at the moment right now, I just think, is that, you know, nonfiction comics, or, you know, whatever you want to call it, is the, I, I think there's a moment here, and uh, this is kind of just one aspect of it, because you've done a whole lot of other comics. I mean, you've done a, you did a great comics about ebooks. Since I write about the digital publishing market too, that I thought was really great. They really kind of, you know, said like, calm down, people. <laughs> yeah. And I thought that was a really great comic. Um, okay. You know, yeah, maybe you do a book on ebooks, maybe not. Maybe. But <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but that, that was really great. I, but I do think well, what we're seeing right now really is uh, the blossoming of comics in the nonfiction, memoir, autobiography, biography area, and you know, well, it's just taking its place. Yeah, it's really amazing. I mean, you have a choice between going to see a movie that's you know a documentary or a movie that's you know the Avengers. It's like, well, obviously, but you have a choice between reading comics sometimes, and um, somebody's personal story told in comics can be really compelling. And um, I think that's really interesting. Difference between comics and, and like film genre. Okay, Emma. Um, now you've, you've already told us a bit about the books. I I, I, I don't know a lot about the series. Um, uh, I sort of know about it because it's in the air. Uh, <laughs> but I am curious about the, the process of the adaptation. I mean, maybe you can tell us a little about that. I mean, you're, are, are these uh, adapted from yeah, the pro series? Yes. Books. So, I mean, how, you know, how is it like that? Who do you work with? Uh, do you work with the original author or an editor? Or? I, I talked to Rochelle as well. Yeah. Uh, because obviously it's, they're her babies. It's her autobiography. Yeah. Uh, uh, basically, uh, talking, uh, you know, it's her life as a, as a kick-ass vampire. Okay. Um, <laughs> it's not really. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, obviously it's More taken from the novels. Yeah. And it's, um, it's a, 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 a girl called Lee Fagoon who does the adaptation, who's an artist herself, actually, another comic. So it's quite interesting because rather than having a prose writer coming in and, and writing a comic script for me, I have a, another artist coming in and writing a script for me. So she's, you know, she was so great because she'd be like, I'm going to avoid things like, and then a hundred people run down a hill. <laughs> the usual things that you have to yeah, deal with about that, yeah. <laughs> the fleets meet, you know. Like, no. um, so, but and what was great as well is that we both really cared about the book an awful lot uh, because it's just such a great book. <coughs> So the process was interesting. In the first book, because obviously when you're finding a feed with a, it was a new publisher, I'd never worked for Penguin before, um, I knew the editor, <laughs> um, but I hadn't worked with the company before. So obviously when you're a new artist, and I was used to working on things where I had a lot more control over them, so in this case I was like, oh no, I'm, I'm an artist, Could I, is this okay? You know, a bit nervous. Um, so, but by book two, I was a bit more confident and I was able to give a lot more feedback and me and Lee would actually give back and forth ideas and I ended up like jumping in and saying, well, maybe this scene would work better here. So we actually got to... Getting a little bold, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> bold. Um, she didn't mind. She didn't mind. Okay. It's fine. <laughs> um, uh, so yeah, I, I managed to get a bit more involved. Um, but it was very much Lee's adaptation. Um, and I think what uh, we maybe found at the beginning, because these are quite big novels, and by the third novel, I mean, the graphic novels take the same size throughout, but by the third novel, the, 
third novel was twice the size of the first novel, and Lee was still having to condense it into a the same size graphic novel, which is a hell of a job. And adaptation, I think, is a very underrated skill. Uh, I mean, I've done Shakespeare adaptations as well, but again, someone else did the script adaptation. I don't know how I feel about doing that, that part of it myself. But she did an incredible job. And I guess the process for her, there's a large part of going through the novel and deciding which are the key themes, which because you're just going to have to cut some out. And these should never be seen. I don't think any adaptation should be seen as a replacement for the original books. Just like a film should never be a replacement, it's just another version. Um, but so my part on it was obviously once the script come through and I dive in and uh, do my pencils and some more. The usual kind of, everyone knows the comic process, but I think that's a question. Um, uh, but I guess I feel with, with this book especially, with any comic I do, I'm always part of a machine and I quite, I quite like that, um, unless I'm doing an independent independent thing, but with this especially so because as well as having a team of us who are working on the comic, and I do just put everything comics by the way, I don't want a graphic novel panel, but it's, it's a comic. You know what? It's all comics. It's all comics. <laughs> um, so with this one it was an even bigger team because we had Rochelle and, and sort of people on her side as well, so it really did feel like the hashtag on Twitter has been dubbed the VA family, which is really cute because it feels like something where the readers, everyone's kind of part of it, everyone feels really excited about it, and I, I love being a part of that whole thing. We've got great people, I know. It's great, we all love each other. Um, no, it's, I'm, I'm really proud of part of it. No, well, they're, 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 they're fabulous looking ones. Um, and um, Tim. Now, Tim and I go back a ways. He's also the uh, the former co-founder, or he continues to be the co-founder <laughs> of the Comic Foundry. Really one of the of really one of the finest, really independent comics magazines. If you don't know anything about it, I guess you, I guess you can still find it online. Yes. And uh, just a terrific, uh, and it, I, I think you got an Eisner too, but if I'm, am I wrong? Uh, a nomination? You were wrong. Okay. Okay. We, have to nominate, we got a nomination and we lost. So. Yes, yeah, so we got a nomination. Okay. But you know, to me a nomination is a big deal too. So, yes. but uh, just to give you some sense. So, I mean, he- I'm over it, it doesn't hurt, it doesn't sting. <laughs> yes. so, thank you. But he brings a, a, a wealth of personality and research and insight and, and love of comics. Uh, to this book. I mean, he's also a, a, an art director and a designer, formerly with Wired, now with Fortune? Uh, Fortune, yeah. Fortune Magazine, uh, back in New York, where he belongs. And um, so I, I just want to make sure you get a sense of just how thoughtfully clever this book is and how vivid the designs are. Um, I mean, one of my favorites, of course, is the, uh, the location of all of the great buildings in Manhattan uh, of superhero origin, like the Baxter Building and, and whatnot. I mean, there's a graph of that. Um, there's another graph, I think, of the popularity of the Superman movies, wherein yes. the graph indeed is Superman. I mean, there are so many instances where, um, you know, uh, the visualization of the data, you know, as I was saying, is the story. Well, that was, that was the interesting thing about doing this book, is that you know, if this were just to appear um, as a poster, right, you could do any type of charge you want. But if it's a book, it, they have to run in succession, they have to run in order. And when you have so many pages, you have to vary the, the techniques and the graphics. Um, and each graphic tells a different story, and so you, you can't be too visually repetitive. Um, so I think that was the interesting thing for me, at least, in doing it in a book that you really had to push yourself to not repeat yourself. Even though a lot of that information might be the same, you have to come up with different ways to tell it in an interesting way. Can you pull out any piece of information to kind of tell us? Because, I mean, I don't. No. I mean, yes, yes, you must. I'm the, I'm the moderator. I get to ask the questions. Uh, well, or as you, you know, you don't have to answer to this, okay, you know, <laughs> as let us know here. But uh, the, Tell us something about the research, because I mean, that's what's great about these, is that they're, this, this is non-fiction. I mean, this is another kind of storytelling. Sure. Uh, it's real research. This, this is probably one of the more difficult ones to produce. Um, it's an animal taxonomy of characters in comics. So, uh, a taxonomy of uh, characters with animals in their names, uh, which was really difficult to just, one, there's no great database for that. Uh, but then also, <laughs> I had to totally understand how the animal kingdoms work and how they're all broken down before you can put them in there. 
but lots of cats, lots of felines, not a lot of dogs, which is weird because I, I kind of think of it as a I'm, as a dog person. That was, but there's not a lot of dog based characters. And, and superheroes being the big dogs of the comic book world, you could say. Yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe not. So it's a mix between um, hard research, like actual data, and then some more subjective based things, like um, uh, a personal history of saying good grief. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> So, so right, you see, you see what I'm saying? This is good <laughs> stuff here. All right, okay, I could talk and talk and talk. I'm known for that, but I'm not going to do it. You get a chance. Let's have some questions. Come on, don't be shy. You. Um, do you think the trend of nonfiction graphic novels is going to increase with time, or is it going to decrease? With time? Uh, is nonfiction? Uh, Graphic novels, if, if that is an oxymoron, graphic nonfiction, let's say, uh, is, uh, is this going to continue? I don't know, we're riding a wave kind of right now, I think with, um, with books like Mouse and Fun Home and stuff like that, it's sort of opened this big door for those that, um, that is still really wide open at the moment, but, um, but who knows? I don't know, I know that their uh, autobio has a little bit of a stigma in the comics world these days, and I think Part of that comes from the, um, the sort of vastness of that one genre. Autobio is like everything. And, you know, people get kind of uh, irritated at things like journal comics when people are like, I got up, I did my laundry, I went to bed, you know? <laughs> that could be a little bit like tiring after the 100,000th one. Um, but, uh, but there are also like really incredible ways for uh, like young comic artists to learn the craft and to be drawing every day and stuff like that. So they serve an important purpose. And, um, Personally, they're some of my favorite is uh, nonfiction comics. I love them. Uh, what I think is really great is that journalism comics are expanding a great deal now. And yes. I've seen a lot more of that. Um, so I think a lot more will open up in that direction, definitely. I think the thing is that the, the good comics, hopefully, are going to decline. Good comics are going to get better. And I think regardless of whether something is nonfiction, the thing is that there are some amazing comics out there that are non-fiction that are wrapped up and like, oh, I want to read your book so bad, I love food, I'm Italian, I love food. Um, that are, they don't pin themselves as, this is a non-fiction real book about real life. You know, I, um, I absolutely love Craig Thompson's Blankets, for instance, which I suppose technically is a non-fiction, it's an autobiographical, but you, you don't read it going, oh, I see it's a non-fiction comic. So, so it's hopefully the thing is that good comics are not going to decline. Good comics are going to get better <laughs> and stay around. I think, if I could just say also, I, the, the, I think yes, because the tools available have never been uh, more more readily, readily available. Like, you could have created a comic during this panel and uploaded it somewhere. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, before, you, 10 years ago, there were only so many people that published, that would have published a nonfiction comic, but now you don't even necessarily need a publisher to, to put it out there. So. Yeah, like look at um, look at Kate Beaton's autobio. I guess they're autobiographical. Mm -hmm. sure. Things that she uh, she takes a photo with her like, on camera and it's on Twitter. <laughs> so yeah, publishing is not as hard as it used to be. I want Hulk and Vagrant to be in a autobiography. <laughs> uh, well, I'm going to chime in and say yeah, um, yes. There's there's more, and believe me, there's much more coming. Uh, and there's mo there's many more very good ones coming because you're absolutely right. At the end of the day, it's really about good comics as it is about good books or whatever you want to talk about. But uh, this is really a field that, we, that is right uh, for this medium, the ability of words and pictures to kind of evoke, to document, uh, to engage the reader that it does it like no other. Um, it, you, you, obviously, journalism is important. You all know the name of Joe Sacco. I mean, he's a sort of a pioneer in some ways, but there's more coming. Uh, Abrams Comics Art has a, an amazing book coming out about climate change next year. Um, biography, trust me. Self-made hero in the UK, Johnny Cash. Self-made hero does Maybe some awesome know. books. So you have no yes, it's coming. They, the uh, a Chinese life, that incredible autobiography of the uh, the Chinese graphic novel, his whole life through the cultural, through the cultural, uh, rather through the Chinese revolution, through the cultural revolution. Just an amazing, amazing life story. Uh, but also, uh, what the, the Initiates is a great book out now from NBM about a comics artist and a winemaker, and they decide to learn each other's business, and it becomes a comic, and it's all about making wine and making comics. And this is just scratching the surface. There's, there's so much more coming out. Uh, this is a great, it's, going to be, it's a great category for comics. 
So now, oh, over here. Yes. Yeah. Um, what you're saying before about how you don't even need to get publish or publish, you think the internet is going to be really a uh, use in the future of publishing graphic novels now? It already is, but anybody else want to want to take that? What do you mean exclusively the internet? Yeah. No. But, but, I think what they're saying is that this is a way. Never before, really, you know, kind of, really in human history, have artists been able to connect directly with readers as easily and as economically as you can right now, and as effectively as you can right now. Not only do you have the ability to put your work in a place where people can read it, but you have the tools actually to kind of promote and market yourself as well. And it's, you're only limited by your imagination and your talent. Um, that said, it's actually become a way to also become legitimately published. Um, Self-publishing is probably one of the better ways to end up conventionally published uh, because you're able to kind of, it's kind of a proof of concept. You can find readers and deliver a, a manuscript as well as an audience to a publisher. But does anybody else want to talk about this beside me? <laughs> Are you asking a group of bookmakers whether print is dead? <laughs> yeah, yes. Media is asking, do you think that if in the future more people do self-publishing and less will actually go to established publishers? Uh, more people will self-publish. Uh, I think there's still a lot of things that traditional publishers currently and will in the future for probably quite a long time. The answer is both. Will continue to, yeah. to offer. Yeah. It's going to be both. So. Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's series of that have been exclusively online. There's series like John Allison's Scary Go Round that was exclusively mm -hmm. online for a very, very long time. It's only just being collected now through open press because he has maintained rights and decided to do that. But it was exclusively online for a very long time. Great, um, yes, great webcomic. Fantastic. Web yeah. yeah. But yeah, I think both. <laughs> yes, it's, it's both. It's going to be a lot of both. And we're all going to be the better for it, including the conventional publishers. More questions? Uh, in the back. Yeah, right on, right on, right on. There's a huge movement with us to provide more access to graphic novels, um, which is great. It's kind of twofold, one for bringing um, people who are already really big fans of graphic novels um, and providing more access to things for them, but also for new audiences that normally wouldn't be reading it. Um, so coming from the actual, from a background um, of the artist and the writer, what would you say, what would you give as advice for we librarians to be telling people to try and like grab them and bring them, you know, into the circle of giving them this opportunity to read collections in libraries? Everybody hear that? Yeah. Yep. I would say, I would like it if you snuck graphic novels into the genre that they belong in rather than the graphic novel section, you know? Like, it would be cool if crime books were all in the crime book section, or crime fiction was all in non-fiction, and, and it all stuff, you know, whether it was a graphic novel or a novel, it was all together, you know? Then they could accidentally pick one up and read it. <laughs> <laughs> and the nice thing about how many graphic novels and the diversity of graphic novels is that there are a lot of genre crossovers. Um, I mean, all of us kind of have these genre, genre crossover books, and, um, and they can totally sneak into the other ones, which I love. Um, I have, my other graphic novel is like in the travel section, it's technically a travel book, and then this book is like a food book, so I often find it in the food section of bookstores and libraries, which is great because I'm like, maybe somebody who's just like looking for a cookbook will pick it up and get into comics, and that would be great. I'm hoping that, um, I'm sure you, you're an on-the-ball librarian because I do a comic con, so you, you already know this, uh, but I used to do a lot of workshops around libraries, school libraries and state libraries, state libraries like council libraries in England. And um, one of the problems we found early on is that even librarians who were keen to get stuff in were forgetting that graphic novels can be age written, they're age rated the same as anything else. And I did have to go around a lot of those libraries and they'd sh I'd say, could you show me a graphic novel section? And they'd be like, well, this one's shiny and, and has, you know, looks like something kids would like. And they'd be like, yeah, that's an 18 plus, like that should not be in the kids section. Because all it takes is one kid taking that book home and going, look, mom, boobs. And, and that's it. You know, we lose comics from libraries, so hopefully I'm sure you're on the ball, but I think it's something to be really aware of is to make sure things are actually suitable for the audience. Don't just whack comics in kids because comics aren't always for kids. Otherwise, the same token, they're not always for adults. It's exactly as it's being said here. In a, in a dream world in the future, we'll go into bookshops and libraries and 
to just see horror, sports, romance, food, you know, and that's where things will be divided rather than into one general graphic novel. So yeah, being, like I know in the UK there are a lot of librarian conferences to discuss what's coming out from publishers and they talk about what genres things should be in, what age groups things are for, just to make sure they're being categorised correctly. Um, and yeah, we don't end up getting them banned, that's a <laughs> I, I, actually, I'm curious to know, do you, have you had issues with uh, people challenging books and the like? Oh, of course. There's always censorship. There's always Where's your library? Your public librarian or a school librarian? Um, I'm actually a special collections librarian, uh -huh. but I worked for um, Marvel for a little while in their uh -huh. library. And um, there are a lot of initiatives around university libraries to kind of grow with their collections. And there's always the case of librarians are really anal about um, cataloging, <laughs> particularly. So, you know, making sure that Library of Congress doesn't fit in, as you were saying, does it fit in travel, does it fit in, and it always gets lumped together in, you know, graphic novel or illustrative or whatever. And so there's always that, um, the conflict of making it available and viewable for the audience if you want it to, working against censorship, and then, of course, working against, you know, the old school librarians who don't even think that it should be around. So, those are a few of and I guess we should also mention that there also is the academic level of uh, graphic novels. I, I see somebody in the audience who I think would appreciate you mentioning that. There is a whole other of graphic novels at the university level. And uh, uh, like Columbia University, right, Karen Green? Yeah. <laughs> Who don't have the same kinds of issues that public and school libraries have. Yeah, she can buy whatever she wants. So see her after the panel. All right, and more questions. Uh, you, right there. I'm wondering uh, what thought the panel has given in terms of telling graphic stories on the internet and the digital medium in ways that you can't tell on regular paper. Um, you know, have you done that? Have you thought about where the medium will go and what you can do in that medium as opposed to on paper? Good question. What's it? <laughs> I, that's always nice. Like ideally, um, if you're working on something for the internet, you want to do something medium specific. Um, the downside to that, of course, is that it then doesn't translate maybe very well to the page. Um, so if you are intending or hoping for it to see the page, you have to work with that medium's limitations instead of you know the uh, the blue sky limitations of say, what's available on the internet, and vice versa. Um. I actually worked on a project a few years ago, a couple of years ago, for Channel 4 in the UK, and it was written by Liam Moore and John Repian. Uh, it was called The Thrill Electric, I believe it's still online. And what they set out to do is it's a historic, it's a, sort of a semi-historical uh, yeah. about Victorian uh, Manchester. And what they wanted to do is, when we got the first meeting, they said we wanted to be a motion comic, and everyone in the room went, oh. <laughs> For good reason, but go on. Like, you know, as we all know, motion comics generally end up being a cheap form of animation. Well, they're not, you know, it's, we didn't want it just to be something that well, we wanted to make an animation, but we did a motion comic instead, you know. So, um, so we, we all sat and brainstormed and said, well, look, we're using the medium of the internet. We weren't looking, exactly as you say, we weren't looking to print it, which meant we had the freedom of saying, well, what can we use? We want to make something that is neither specific to web or specific to print. It needs to be something that's like, or rather it is specific to web, sorry, but it's not like an animation. So what they ended up coming up with, and I, I do think it's still alive, I did all the design work, but I didn't do the pages, but um, what they ended up doing was this, this comic where you could, it was done on all these amazing layers, so the speech bubbles were ahead of other things, so you could dive into the panels. So it was like a comic layer, but you could move around things in the panel, and occasionally a, a, something would suddenly animate, like a bird would fly by the window, or there'd be a sound effect in the middle of it. And I think that, was the closest I've seen so far to something that's really tried to be neither one or the other. Like it's something specific that you can only achieve it in that format. And I think that's really interesting. The trouble is monetizing it. Yeah, very there, good. I mean, and there's some excellent uh, recent subtle examples. Um, Zach, uh, <coughs> I don't remember his last name, his video game comics, is doing very nice things with subtle animated GIFs. Uh, Emily Carroll is doing wonderful things with like vertical page scrolling. There's a recent Boule Core. Um, infinite scrolling comic yes. keep scrolling down and down and down. Yeah, yeah. yeah but uh, way a uh, thrill bit has, has some interesting ways of uh, using comic comics in sequence, panels in sequence. Uh, the main fire guys are doing interactive yeah, digital yeah. comics that uh, do actually introduce some partial animation. Um, sometimes quite tasteful, sometimes maybe not so much. Um, but um, 
even the uh, Comixology's guided view uh, and what the Marvel Infinity, they're also doing some interesting things with sequencing. Yeah, something. Yeah. And also with, with sound effects and you know, all the like too. So it, there's stuff happening. It's a great time for experimentation. And now at the end of the day, we, we, uh, you know, when a comic is uh, you know not com images in sequence, you know, uh, is it really working? And I, I mean, that's, I think these are the issues that we're working through in this this period of fermentation. I, there's a flip side of that too, real quick, I just yeah. want to address this, is that the flip side to making something that's a webcomic that can only be a webcomic is actually forced me to make a book that can only be a book. Like, when I do that <laughs> I, But it, it's yeah. true, like, I, I think, like, you can throw a PDF up online and read it or whatever, and that's fine, and then, but then it's like, what's the point of buying the book? So, like, I find that, like, the more people do webcomics and stuff online, the more that's pushing me to make, like, a hardcover book with a dust jacket that actually has a purpose, or like pages or page numbers or things that are specific to actual physical books that you can't replicate online either, because so I, I still love books. Yeah. <laughs> We're seeing some beautiful things happening in publishing that may be like really special editions that may be partly coming about, as you say, as a reaction to yeah. I mean, in many ways, I think Chris Ware's book, I should build stories, was in, in many ways uh, a book that you know could essentially be made into a digital product. And at the same time, actually, it was a book that kind of chronicled every manner of print publication. It was like uh, 14 different kinds of publications. It was a, a hardcover book, a magazine, a newspaper, a, a, you know, a, a kid's book, a, a board game. So, you know, it's, it was sort of a, a homage to the print publication uh, of various kinds. Ah, let's hear Who's Who's next? Blue Hat. I read a web comic, for example, like there's one on Activate I love called Everywhere, and it just presupposes that different types of animals or people just take over, completely flood like frogs from the sky kind of thing. And they're usually two to six pages, so it's kind of a, an ADHD fast-paced read. When I'm sitting at my computer, when I'm on the internet, that's more what I'm looking for, whereas when I'm reading something published, I'm on a train or I'm sitting down, I'm taking the time to just focus on the fact. And I'm wondering if you guys use that if you're involved in any web comics at all. When if there's different kinds of readings for the screen and for, for print? It, yeah. Are you taking that into, my, into perspective, what people are doing when they're in those different vibes, whether they're reading or they're online? I want them to be drinking tea. <laughs> <laughs> Part of the reason, reading process is. Yeah, I always, my, my intention with Delilah Dirk was to make a graphic novel that you would sit down for a, and read for a long time. It, like, it was kind of a response to the things I didn't like about floppy comics or about shorter comics. I wanted it to be something more of something that, you know, didn't, there's no cliffhanger of 30 pages or something you didn't have to wait a month. So, so solving my pet peeves and creating something you sit down and, and, you know, like you say, like get into it, dig into it, as opposed to it being a distraction or a, or a quick getaway. Uh, my first book, uh, Americus, um, I wrote to be a, like a graphic novel like this, um, and then the company decided to serialize it online, a page a day, and there were weeks when, um, like, one page would go up and then people would have all these questions and they're like, what's the deal with this thing? Why is that, why hasn't this been set? And I'm like, uh, it, like Wednesday next week, <laughs> we find out. But like, it's, it's like four pages away and we did like a Monday, Wednesday, Wednesday Friday thing and it, I felt it kind of hurt the reading of it for people who only read it online because it, it like packed it up into bits they, they wanted to um, keep throwing that work up online this year. They were like, um, we don't have time to make this a website. Been there, done that. We're really. so busy right now. <laughs> well, that, that's a good point. I mean, I mean, the book wasn't really designed to be read that way and was kind of forced into it. So, uh, I mean, the, obviously this that, that path has been useful to some, but maybe yeah. this um, wasn't the best practice. Comic called About a Bull, and I it takes me a really long time.
trying to draw everything, but I, I'll only put it up a chapter at a time, so it's not like, here's this weird cliffhanger that has absolutely no resolution. Um, instead, you just have to be looking here. I guess the equivalent, we're just talking about a short, digestible form of webcomic, yeah. so you know, become a strip book. You know, I mean, obviously, if, if you're wanting something that you're just reading in between work, then you're not maybe going to want a long form story, but there are plenty of comics out there that are just short strips that are designed to be read quickly as comic books. So, you know, just don't dive into the world life history and comic form if you're on a quick break. <laughs> yeah, that's what I, so I had an epiphany like three or four years ago when I was at a convention and a guy came up and bought my new book, which is three story, and it's like 250 pages long, you know, and he bought it and then like an hour later he came back. And he's like, oh, I read your book over lunch, and it was like really great and everything he was going on about. It. I was like, I spent a year working. <laughs> 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 it, was funny. it was funny and also horrible at the same time. But I, I, it changed me as an author after that, you know, because I, you know, it does take me years. So when I design a book now, I am thinking about what the experience is, and I want you, when you're done with that book, I don't want you to think you got it all. Like I want you to have been satisfied, but also know that you should probably go through one more time to get it all, you know, and because I feel like it's a lot of work to do that. I worked in doggone it, you're going to work too. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we're getting down to the wire here. A couple more questions, right here. Okay. All right, making a living, piracy, you know, there, that, that says it all. That's the whole story of comics. <laughs> let's, so let's hear it. <laughs> well, I, you'll notice I introduced myself as an animator first. And then, <laughs> well, the fact that I've never uh, It is financially difficult to use a graphic. Yeah, I would probably all similar ish things, but. Um, I mean, I, I am a full-time comica, that's what I do, but I don't just work on one book. I'll, I'll work on, like, several things with different publishers at the same time. I'll do my little tiny things with publishers like Marvel occasionally. I'll do, I'll still take on, like, commission work in between stuff. I might run workshops. Um, so I am a comica full-time, but that doesn't mean I'm working, I don't have the luxury of working on one book all the time. You know, that would be amazing. So, yeah, I'd imagine people are similar to that. <laughs> um, yeah, it involves a lot of juggling. Um, it helps if you can get other people to do like the harder work of drawing. Um, <laughs> I'm the writer on this book and the other book this company put out. Um, it's terrible. Learn how to be very frugal. That is the best advice I can give you. Today. The flip side of that, though, is that if you're able to do a project that you are passionate about, you love it. I mean, that's its own form of reward to some people. It depends on your value system, etc. Blah, 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 blah. Getting to work on something you love is rewarding. And to not feel doom and gloom. It's not like it's impossible to make, you know, it, there are always out there making good money. So it's not like everyone making comics is sitting there on the bread like, you know, you can actually. <laughs> We're making it sound very negative here. Of course, yes, you can make money and it is viable. I think you just have to be prepared to be quite versatile. And with more and more people reading graphic novels, the publishing industry will get better, and will pay better, and like, it'll get better for us. <laughs> and, and, and someone who, if I may say so, will be close to the oldest person in the room, if not a other in, this, in the whole convention center. Um, uh, it, it's a different world than it was when I started here. I mean, there are certainly more opportunities out there uh, for comics artists. Uh, in my view, it seems now than ever before. And we, we're, we're living in a new golden age uh, of comics publishing, in, in my humble opinion. And uh, the product of that humble, in that incredible golden age is right here up on the stage. On that note, we're going to have to bring this in. The, uh, please give a big round of applause to our family. Uh, and, you know, go out and buy their books so that they can keep making them.